Hello, my friend. My name is Byron, and I'm from the BJJ Brick Podcast. I want to thank you for checking out the podcast on the YouTube channel here. It's a weekly show dedicated to Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu and having fun on the mats. Enjoy the show. Thank you for listening to the BJJ Brick Podcast. We'll be bringing you Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu and good times. We hope to flatten your jiu-jitsu learning curve, help you get the most out of your grappling ability, and meet your goals both on and off the mat. Welcome back to the BJJ Brick Podcast. This is episode 232. My name is Byron. I'm here with my buddies Gary and Joe. They just got matching broken heart tattoos, and uh, it really looks nice when they're hanging out together. And they kind of reunite their little tattoos together. This is going to be a great episode. We have Lachlan Giles joining us for the interview of the week. My freshly tattooed buddies. What's up, my friends? Byron, how are you doing, man? <laughs> doing good. Doing yeah, good. Byron, we cannot wait to get you on the mat. Um, you know, it's like you always get a freebie against us right off the bat. But uh, it's going to be payback time there someday, my friend. What do you mean by this? I'm going to have your back. Literally. Nice. Well, that, that happens from time to time. That's not a big deal. I just Actually, know that... no, it doesn't. <laughs> if, if I see... Uh, When's the t- last time I got your back? It doesn't happen. <laughs> you just... No, you go uh, side, north, south, Camorra. Because <laughs> I can't get your back. <laughs> no need. <laughs> we got a great episode. We have a, a quote that Gary can make work somehow. It's going to be amazing. And a really cool article from one of our past guests, Bernardo Faria. So, uh, man, we got it going on, guys. Yeah, we always have it going on. And speaking of having it going on, I actually have the the off-the-mat lesson today. Uh, Normally, I don't ever have one because I'm not very smart and can figure these things out. But, you know, I I had kind of a a weird situation that happened with me and my son. And, you know, it was a lack of communication on my side and kind of messed everything up. But kind of what happened was my son was getting ready to have a basketball game. And uh, so I was telling him to be aggressive. And, you know, my son growing up with me and growing up around the wrestling mats and wrestling and everything, he took, when I said be aggressive, literally, uh, kind of like I have your back, <laughs> literally. <laughs> but, uh, you know, what I was meaning is, you know, play really hard on defense, move your feet, try to, you know, get in the passing lane, steal the ball. When you get the ball, give a pump fake and go straight to the basket trying to score. If not, draw a foul. But I didn't do a very good job of communicating. I just told him to be aggressive. And, you know, with me and my buddies, the way we play is we choke each other out. We uh, try to break each other's arms. We twist them in the wrong angles. Uh, We, you know, double leg blast each other into another county. Um, So what my son took it as is let's get out there and be really physical and throw people around. And my son's a little guy for his age, but uh, he's kind of a scrapper. So he's going out there and he's just grabbing everybody and throwing them (laughs) it was not a pretty sight um you know he ended up uh getting fouls left and right um and uh he wasn't having fun he didn't have a smile on his face like he normally does when he plays basketball and so at halftime and normally i try never to get involved with a game you know that's up for the coach and everything but you know, I know my son better than anybody, and so I knew that I gave him bad information, and he's going to follow exactly what I say. And, you know, he had a rough first half. He was just, uh, you know, nothing was going his way. He was, uh, you know, trying to throw bigger people around. And so at halftime, I went up to him. I was like, hey, Connor, you know, I'm sorry. I messed up. When I said play aggressive, I meant for you to hustle everywhere, try to get the loose ball, uh, run back, play hard defense. Don't follow people. Don't you know, attack people. I, I think I told it to you wrong. I, I want to see a smile on your face when you're out there playing. In the second half, it was a totally different story. He didn't get any fouls. He probably scored, you know, eight points, just had a really good game. And, uh, you know, uh, it made me think that, you know, especially if you're teaching younger kids or you need to, I can't just say something. I need to make sure everybody explains it, you know, like, hey, I want you to do this. Does everybody understand what I'm talking about? Instead of me just saying, hey, I want you to do this and then turn my back and go away. So uh, semantics, a way of explaining stuff and and making sure that uh, uh, your audience knows exactly what you're saying will definitely pay big dividends. 
Yeah, good lesson, Carrie. I like that one. It uh, it, it goes to on both like communicating well and uh, taking responsibility when the communicating doesn't go well because you could it's like clearly you don't mean to foul kids all the time. Like, but you took responsibility. Hey, you know, my bad. <laughs> I didn't communicate what I really wanted you to try to do out there, which made it easy for him to, uh, you know, change what he was doing and not feel bad about it and just play the way he, he should be playing. Yeah, but it kind of backfired the next week, too. <laughs> um, you know, I, I told him next week, go out with a smile on your face and just play great. But kind of a crazy story is uh, he gets a breakaway layup and gets smacked in the mouth. And no foul was called, which, you know, no biggie. It happens. But I see him holding his mouth, and it looked like something fell into his hand and then fell onto the floor. And I realized he got one of his teeth knocked out. So he reaches down, grabs his tooth off the off the, the floor, runs over and puts it on the bench so he didn't lose it because he wanted to make sure he got some uh, money for it, <laughs> and then runs down the down the court and just smashes the guy who did it. <laughs> And ended up getting a flagrant foul and getting put on the bench. But on that one, I was, uh, uh, you know, he got his tooth knocked out. I was kind of proud of him for, uh, you know, <laughs> just getting up and keep playing. Yeah. yeah. How do you how do you lose a tooth and not get the call? Yeah, that's the crazy part. You know, um, that's uh, especially not even a front tooth. It was one of his uh, side <laughs> tooth. And I, I'm glad it was a baby tooth. Uh, otherwise, I'd probably have a huge uh, medical bill or a dentist bill. Wow. It really hit good, him pretty hard good then, stuff, huh? Gary. Yeah, either that or he's got loose teeth because I don't do a very good job of uh, telling him to brush his teeth, you know? He gets those tough jeans from his mother. Yeah, but, uh... definitely not from me. You've seen me on the mat. I'm, uh, I'm a baby. Oh, man. Uh, basketball is tougher than you think, I guess. Yeah, you know, all the years I've played basketball, I think I've had probably more injuries in basketball than I have in jiu-jitsu. Um, but I actually think jujitsu is much tougher. I do think it can be safer though. If you're it, a lot of that depends on your training partners. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I agree. If you have good training partners, it's a safe way to stay in shape. And that brings us to our sponsor this week. Uh, health IQ is sponsoring the show. Health IQ is a life insurance company that looks for people who are living healthy lifestyles and rewards them with lower uh, life insurance. The simple comparison is with car insurance. If you have a good driving record, you don't pay as much for your uh, car insurance. If you have a bad driving record, you're getting pulled over all the time, uh, you're getting caught in races like Gary and and all these sort of crazy things, you're going to pay more for your car insurance. So that's not really being done in the life insurance industry. You basically just pay the same as everybody, except for Health IQ. Uh, if you're healthy, you're likely to live longer. If you're training jujitsu, you're likely to be healthy, thus also live longer. Don't pay the same life insurance rates as everybody else out there. Check out the link in the show notes to Health IQ, and they have a little quiz, and uh, it is hard. <laughs> but they they basically want to figure out kind of how fit you are, and then uh, some knowledge you have of you know different healthy lifestyle things, eating and, and that sort of thing. And I think Gary and Joe have done it, and they did far better than me. But uh, <laughs> it's I was it was very challenging for that quiz. But go, to, it's just kind of fun to see. I learned a lot taking the quiz. But uh, uh, go there, check it out, check out the quiz, and uh, look into saving yourself money for something that we all need to have uh, provide safety to our families if something bad happens to us. So uh, health like you, check out the link in the show notes. You know, Byron, we talk about the specific company because they're sponsoring the show right now. But really, guys, if you're in your 30s, 40s, and you've got a family and you don't have life insurance, you're taking a big risk that you may leave them with a lot of unexpected expenses. And, uh, man, if I were to pass, I wouldn't want to leave my family in that position. So if you don't have life insurance, go check it out. And, hey, we're speaking of talking about saving money here today. Our quote this week is from a guy who is really good at saving money, uh, Ben Franklin. And what he said, uh, we talked about it last week, is a penny saved is a penny earned. And Byron thinks that there's no way I can translate this into uh, about jujitsu. But I think uh, I think I can. I think I can prove him wrong. All right. Uh, 
But basically, a penny saved is a penny earned. Uh, money not spent is, you know, money in your pocket. Um, basically, you can earn money with that. You can earn interest. But the way I look at it, a penny saved is a penny earned is, you know, a penny is also knowledge. Knowledge is power. Knowledge is money. And basically, the way I was kind of looking at it is if Byron teaches me some concepts, uh, teaches me some new moves, teaches me stuff, you know, I basically have that. It's earned. I'm, you know, I've drilled it. I've earned it. I am now putting it back into my brain. I, I'm drilling it. My myelin is getting thicker. How do you like that, Byron? Threw myelin in there. Big word. Her. Good word. Yeah. Yep. And uh, basically, uh, you know, I'm learning stuff. You know, I, I'm, you know, money is money is is knowledge you know that's the way i look at it um there's another jujitsu application to that uh to that quote so just to make sure everybody knows that uh, byron's gonna be wrong twice today the the other uh, <laughs> aspect is is with injuries you know injuries accumulate and uh everybody knows that the more you get banged up the harder it is to keep moving later in life and so if you train smart you choose your training partners wisely like an injury not incurred is an injury that's not going to be in that bank 10 years down the road. So yeah, good, smart uh, training, injury avoidance, and uh, your health bank account will be much fuller when you're 50. Man, I, I didn't think of that one, Joe, but that is great. As I'm sitting here, you know, holding a microphone and my wrist hurts and, you know, <laughs> it, it, and it's really, I mean, both my wrists, uh, you know, I rolled here a little bit before we came on and, uh, you know, I had a little bit of 30 minutes before we, we started talking and you know i had ice packs on both the wrist and that's uh you know injuries that have occurred uh and i have not taken enough time off to really heal them and uh like you said it's uh, uh another application of that uh um quote and you know i'd like to hear byron's uh, take on this quote wouldn't you joe yeah I, i'm real interested a penny saved is a penny earned man <laughs> you guys have done really well with this quote uh i'm gonna just go for the easy kill here if you're spending money on other activities uh that money is not available uh, for jiu-jitsu style of, of activities uh oh, you're wrong Byron. <laughs> it's not wrong being saved today <laughs> actually i didn't think of that one that was the most applicable one right there good job <sighs> well but you're not really saving your money you're just waiting to spend it somewhere else <laughs> no but i mean it I mean, what's the biggest thing you hear? Well, I guess there's time too, but you know, one of the big things I hear about people not training is they don't have the money. Um, you know, everybody thinks jujitsu is expensive, and you know, I hear that over and over again. But if it really means something to you, I mean, stop going out to eat once a week at, at you know, going out to eat once a week. That'll that'll pay for you right there. You're you're saving money for at the end of the month, so you got money for your your uh, uh, monthly dues. Bada boom, yep. bada bing. Man, I could go a long time with this quote. It's a good one, Gary. Yeah. Knocked it out of the park today. So if, if you missed <laughs> and last Byron week's... And Byron said it was a bad one. So, Byron, you lost again. That's four times today. <laughs> if, if you missed last week's episode, Gary threw this one out at the end. And also we threw out the... I think it was last week we threw out the idea of getting matching tattoos. Uh, just kind of a funny opening. And I, Gary's like, I could make this quote happen. And I said, okay, well, I'll write it down and uh, we'll see if we can get it to work. And he did it. We have to. We have to be wearing the right nogi shorts, actually, for our matching tattoos to be visible. So, oh. not everybody. Not everybody gets to see them. Well, I don't know if they're actually called shorts or chaps. <laughs> <laughs> we need to make grappling chaps. You know that probably oh, wouldn't be a bad idea. That's a terrible idea. <laughs> the only have time I ever told a- you about my idea. About making cauliflower ear inserts. <laughs> to to look know, tough? Yeah, you know, there's people who want cauliflower ear. I think somehow, like, we should be able to, uh, you know, make some kind of inserts that you clip in and looks realistic that you have cauliflower ear. I think people would buy them. Yep, and then those fake sleeve tattoos you pull up and yep. you'd be a tough guy in 10 minutes. <laughs> Definitely. That sounds like an audio book Gary once wrote. <laughs> well, it's going to be here shortly. <laughs> oh, man. Give us about 15 minutes. <laughs> After the interview, we'll see what we get. And actually, I'm going to have a little surprise for you guys on that one as well. But, uh, yeah, I, I had a great surprises. time interviewing uh, Lachlan Giles. 
a lot of cool explanations, which we realize this is a podcast, it's audio. I'm fully confident that we can provide something that you could listen to that actually helps you get better at jiu-jitsu, helps you stay motivated. Like, it's not impossible, but man, the way uh, he was explaining things, it was coming across like he was with me, and I'm like, this makes perfect sense, and I was really excited to get him uh, on the show, and once I got to talking to him, man, like, when you get to, we'll get to the part where he's talking about uh, learning takedowns, and, and some things he does differently, you know, when, when teaching those, and uh, it was just like, this makes total sense to me. And I'm, I'm so glad to hear that. And then, you know, then I get all pumped up. But anyway, so that's coming up. Here we go. Lachlan Giles. He is the most interesting grappler in the world. He has had a short career as a pharmacist. He got fired because he was recommending jujitsu for 95% of his patients. His idea of a performance-enhancing drug is better technique. He has been tested for this, and the results were positive. Chuck Norris's wife has a tattoo of his face. I don't always listen to podcasts, but when I do, I prefer the BJJ Brick podcast. Stay sweaty, my friends. All right, my friends, I'm happy to bring Lachlan Giles to the BJJ Brick Podcast. Lachlan, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah, well, I'm real excited to have you here. We've had a couple of your students on here, and they talked uh, very well about you, and, and now we get you and really the heart of, of what you're up to there in Australia. Uh, Craig Jones, check out that episode. He talked about you quite a bit, and and uh, Kit Dell mentioned you several times as well. Uh, Lachlan, uh, besides training with those guys, give us a little bit of... Uh, personal history about you and jiu-jitsu and, and what you're up to? Well, I've been training a long time now, about 16 years. I was about 15 years old when I first started jiu-jitsu, and that was after after training Kung Fu. <laughs> from, I watched the Jet Li movie, and I thought, oh, Kung Fu looks pretty good. So I started <laughs> that, and then somehow, this would have been about 13 or 14 years old, and then somehow I came across UFC 1, and saw Hoist Gracie um, kicking ass with jiu-jitsu. And I thought, first I, I sort of tried to deny that it was better than Kung Fu, but then I uh, I started to think maybe I needed to try a jiu-jitsu class. And then once after that, I was, I was hooked. Um, so I was training, you know, I was, I was obviously – pretty young then so I was training you know a couple of times a week it was a, it was a pretty far drive my dad used to drive me about you know 40 minutes to um, to the jiu-jitsu school there weren't many schools around in those days um, and so I sort of was a I'd say a, a hobbyist probably up until probably eight eight years ago um, so I was a when I was a brown belt I managed to Actually, do pretty well at one of the um, Abu Dhabi comp- so in Australia at one of the trials for the Abu Dhabi Pro, um, which was like a combined brown black belt division. And I, I came second in that. And that when I came second in that, I sort of realised that maybe I could I could actually do pretty well in competition if I focused a bit more. Um, so probably the last eight years, I've actually really knuckled down and and what I'd say has been a near, uh, I say full time jujitsu in that, like I probably train as much as my body will allow without overdoing it. So I wouldn't, even if I, um, you know, had more free time during the day, I'd still probably wouldn't train more because I think it's important to have enough rest as well. But yeah, so here we are now. I uh, opened up Absolute St Kilda around just over three years ago. Um, so that's one of th- there's three um, gyms under the banner of Absolute. I oh, will now four now because we've got Shanghai. But um, there's four gyms under Absolute, and I'm um, a coach out of the St Kilda gym. You got a lot going. There. I want to kind of rewind a little bit and learn about you making that transition. I think I said you were a brown belt. You got second at uh, ADCC trials, and it was like kind of a switch. Like I might be able to do this at a very high level. 
Yeah. What was that like? What did you change? After that? Yeah, what did you change to um, take it to the next, uh, try to get to that next level? I think just, I think it was more like my focus. Because, I mean, I was training. I still, I competed, you know, occasionally um, at that stage too. But just to, um, I suppose, having got so close to, you know, that would that was probably the, hardest competition in Australia to win at the time because you, you know the the prize was flights and you know uh, accommodation and and so on to to Abu Dhabi to compete in their um, world championships so I, you know I knew that was such an important competition for, for so many people in Australia so after that I think I just started to study jiu-jitsu a lot more um you know, I started to look into techniques a lot more. Uh, my partner, or my fiance, Liv, she um, she had just started jujitsu around that time as well, which was probably a bit of a catalyst too. So suddenly, yeah, when the person you're in a relationship with does jujitsu, it means you can <laughs> you can knuckle down a bit more. Um, and and she was training at a different place, and her coach. Uh, his name was Dan Shaw. He was a very you know, studious guy. Like he was watching the Mundials, the, the Worlds, and and a lot of instructional DVDs and studying the game a bit. So just speaking to him and getting his influence as well, and you know his his take on jujitsu kind of changed the way I looked at at the sport a bit. And um, yeah, so that kind of I think everything sort of came together there, and I started putting a lot of time and effort into jujitsu after that. So you say you, you put in, uh, I think you call it like near full-time uh, training. You, you could train yeah. more. You have time available, but you're, you're really, your body is getting uh, the most training that you can get out of it. Is that, is that correct? Well, yeah. I mean, take, so for a few, a few of the, quite a few of those years, I was working part-time as a physiotherapist. Um, and then I, you know, I was doing my PhD up until a year ago. Um, but during that, like, you know, I was still uh, uh, training twice a day most of the time. So, you know, I don't think, I don't think you can get away with much more than twice a day. So I say, when I say full time, I might've had other, (laughs) other work or other commitments going on, but I feel like, you know, I wouldn't, even if I didn't have those commitments, I still would have been able to, I I wouldn't have been able to do much more jujitsu. So I'll say it was full time. Is it, what is your training regimen like now? I'm actually because I'm I'm now 31 years old, so I'm actually trying to. I feel I feel the you know the effects of training a little more than I used to, so I'm actually trying to do a little less um, training than before. So I'm trying to do one one good session a day, and maybe a little bit of you know, light technique or or you know like specific training at, at the other session during the day. I'm obviously teaching. I'm teaching classes. Yeah, you know, probably like you on average three, maybe four classes a day. Um, but I'll probably only have like hard rolls in in one of the classes, and and maybe do some specific training in the in the other one. Yeah, Lachlan, I've heard I've heard things about both sides. It's for some competitors, if they're teaching, it kind of makes it hard to compete at their level they want to be at. And some competitors say that teaching helps a little bit. In fact, that it makes them look at jiu-jitsu differently and through a different set of eyes. How does teaching affect your competitive uh, grappling? I think, yeah, it's definitely like I could do it differently if if I was all up to me and I didn't have students to to teach. Um, yeah, I think from a technical point of view, it's great. Like you. Yeah, you will hone down or, you know, because anything that you do, you start to break it down because you're going to teach, usually you'll often teach your game as well as other, you know, parts of jiu-jitsu as well, but you're teaching your game to your students and then, you know, people ask you questions and about, you know, well, you know, what if they do this or that and it makes you actually really analyze how and why your techniques work, which can often come back and improve the way you do it because you, you get a better understanding exactly what you what you're trying to do with that technique, so... I think from a technical point of view, it's good. Um, I think, you know, I could probably design a better training program for myself if it was just all focused on me, <laughs> you know. Um, but that's, uh, yeah, that's the trade-off, I guess. 
Um, so yeah, I think like, you know, I think it's cause it's most of my training still done in the class format, you know, like, uh, I've got students in, you know, it, it, when I'm doing my roles or my specific training, I'm, I'm doing the class for everyone, not just for me. Yeah. So it might be things that I see that other people need to work on. And I say, okay, well let's, let's focus on this area today. Whereas obviously if it was my own training, I'd only do things that, that I need to work on, which wouldn't be suitable for the class necessarily. Yeah. And is there, and this might be a, a, a dumb question, but uh, taking that question on like flipping it over, how has competing at this high level changed you as a coach? I'm not sure it does. Okay. Too much. I think, um, <laughs> I was wondering, okay, I'll just strike that under the, uh, the kind of a dumb question. <laughs> no, 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 no. It's, I think it's a good question, but, um, I think most of my students are not like, you know, trying to be high level yeah. world champions. So I, I don't try to, um, you know, enforce the way I sort of approach jujitsu onto them in, in that regard. Um, yeah. Uh, so I, yeah, I don't know how much of an influence that has. Yeah. So y- you have uh, been competing at this high level for quite a while. Uh, also, you had to take school very seriously as well. What was that like, yeah. and, and how did that go? That was all right. I was so I did my PhD. So that was a you know, obviously I, I did my undergraduate physiotherapy to co- course that was just out of I came out of high school. So that would have geez, that was almost ten years ago that I finished that. Um, and then I started my PhD would have been about five years ago, um, and finished that about a year ago. So, um, well, actually that was technically a full-time PhD, but I somehow, I don't reckon I put <laughs> full-time hours into it, um, but I somehow finished it and I, and I completed the degree. So, um, yeah, I mean, it was, at times it was really hard, like, it was because it's it's research based. So there were times when you know I had to submit you know a paper by a certain date or whatever, and and when that was the case, I'd be up you know, till three in the morning, you know, writing, and that was reasonably stressful and um, and difficult. But then there was times when there wasn't too much I had to do, and I could just train as much as I like. But I had to you know trainings really fun but yeah i had to put you know when when i had a deadline for the phd i had to put that first if that makes sense i could still train because i i mean if you're working I, don't, I can't think of a single like job that involves your brain where like, like you know writing or or research where you're going to be an effective writer for you know 12 hours a day yeah you're trying to write up your paper and you're doing it for 12 hours of the day like I would go insane if I didn't break that up by going to jiu-jitsu class and um, and actually you know, exercising and you know, relieving a bit of stress doing that. So yeah, yeah. And some people talk about having uh, benefits after they get done exercising. They get back to it. They're working that that next hour or two is much more productive than the several hours beforehand. Absolutely, I think that's um, pretty well uh, been studied quite a lot and shown to be very true. So. Um, yeah, I mean, to be honest, for me, I don't. If, if after about two hours of of anything, you know, right, writing wise, I need a break, regardless. You know, I, you know, if, whether I whether it's going and doing jujitsu or if I have to you know, just watch a, a YouTube clip or something just to get my mind off it for a moment, and then I'll come back to it. So yeah, um, so in in a way, like as much as it's a a lot of time and effort, um, I don't think it influence like impact my jujitsu too much um maybe other you know parts of my life yeah i probably watch less <laughs> television or something which is probably a good thing yeah <laughs> just didn't have that kind of idle time to just do it there's nothing or whatever people do yeah <laughs> well i mean yeah you got a phd by the end of it and uh you're a world-class competitor uh, kind of the same time frame, and you know, you got you, you had a lot of stuff going on at the same time. Uh, see on your uh, profile that you also have competed in and done, uh, you know, well, champion at Australian freestyle wrestling. Uh, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> tell me a little bit about that. That sounds interesting. Well, yeah, that well, that was um, 
that competition was not too difficult. That there was only a couple of people entered for some reason. But um, I've been training wrestling pretty. So even at the moment, I'm doing three sessions a week of of wrestling. Um, so that's where I've got to head off to after this, actually. Um, but I've actually, it's it's very hard to say how long I've been training for in wrestling because basically when I first start, like when I was probably 17 or 18, which would have been, you know, what, 12 or 13 years ago, I started doing some wrestling then. And then I had a, a knee injury from that, um, which I kind of said, all right, I'm done with wrestling. I'm not doing that anymore. I had to get surgery on my knee. Um, and then probably three, two or three years ago, I, um, I came back to it and I think that was after I qualified for, for ADCC in Brazil. So the, I won the, the ADCC trials, which were, in, were held in Korea, um, to compete at ADCC Brazil, which was what, 2015. So this would have been about, yeah, about three years ago, um, and I decided, well, if I'm doing ADCC, I've got to get good at wrestling. So I started training wrestling and then obviously qualifying for ADCC again made me focus even more on that. So I really enjoy it. It's, it helps so much with, with jiu-jitsu if you get good at wrestling. It's just a, uh, maybe a bit more physically demanding than jiu-jitsu can be. Lachlan, I hear people from time to time say that they train wrestling and they – there's really that doesn't tell me really what they're doing. Sometimes that just simply means that they're working on takedowns for jujitsu or MMA or no gi. Sometimes they're actually doing wrestling, working on pins and and you know the different positions that wrestling has. What what are you doing when you say you train? Uh, like a couple today, you're gonna go do wrestling. What, what does that mean? Um, so well, it'll be it's it's wrestling. You know, like um, when I when I'm training wrestling, we don't do submissions. Okay, yeah. yeah. It's probably more like how I, in the class I focus a little different to what some of the other people focus. Uh, so we've got our coach was at the Olympics last year. Uh, no, not last year, the year before now, <laughs> 20, 2016 Olympics um, in Rio. Uh, and we've got a guy that's there training as well that's in the Commonwealth Games coming up. So there's some, some pretty good coaches and, and competitors there um but they're obviously you know they're working everything in wrestling for me I, I just try to focus on the first point part you know like from from standing to the ground um so i i imagine if i'm wrestling against one of them i try to um i try to get the first points which is obviously very difficult against someone of that <laughs> level but um, so try and get them to their back or you know get around towards their back from there and Maybe I spend a little bit of time trying to turn them over, get the pin, but I, I more of that happens in the transition. You know, I treat I treat it like it's a ADCC. Like if I was doing a double leg and I had a chance to like kind of hold them on their back, which is actually how the ADCC rules work anyway. Like you actually got to to get points for a takedown, you got to get them flat on their back for for three seconds, which is crazy because you know, that's very hard to do. Um, so I kind of. I focus on that a bit. I imagine it's an ADCC match almost, but without the submissions. And so is that a pretty big advantage to train with these athletes versus uh, normal jiu-jitsu people that are trying to wrestle? You're actually getting uh, really good wrestlers in there and, and working with them. I imagine that's a, oh, a huge yeah. huge advantage. Especially when, um, you know, going into... I think if, if you just doing it for as a hobbyist it probably doesn't matter that much but um if you're trying to compete at something like adcc you want to have very high level wrestlers you need to i think you need to feel really confident in your wrestling to be able to do it in competition because especially once you add submissions like it's so dangerous shooting for a leg if someone can can guillotine you or get a kimura or or anything really uh, any of those submissions that that can occur during that process, you know, leg attacks even as well. You go for a single leg, they can do the scissor takedown um, to a heel hook, you know. So there's a lot you have to watch out for, and therefore I feel like you have to be really, really good at the 
at the takedown part of it. It's got to be quick. You've got to be able to get the leg and get them down before they can really set up a good counter-attack or submission. Um, so having high-level wrestling training partners means that, like, if you can actually get your move to work on them, you know that, you know, the guy that you fight, even in ADCC, is not going to be as good as your Olympic wrestler at defending a takedown. So, well, they shouldn't be. Yeah, unless they are an Olympic yeah. wrestler. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, that's right. Um, well, that's, I mean, I've, you know, I fought JT Torres. <laughs> he, he took me down. So, even, I felt good with the wrestling, but he was fast. Yeah, so, yeah. Anyway, so, more work. More work to do. Yeah. <laughs> um, this is kind of an interesting area of training we're talking about because you're training with really high wrestlers and then you, you like you get really good at your takedowns to where you could, you know, you kind of get on there and you feel how um, to pull these off. And then you try to transition this over to where somebody could uh, throw up, throw on a guillotine or catch you in something else as you're, as you're shooting in. And, and yeah. you can't expect a wrestler to, to do that for you as a training partner. How do you, besides you mentioned like wanting to hit that takedown fast, how do you make sure that you're doing the right thing? This doesn't need to be necessarily about just uh, takedowns, but any part of your game, um, make sure that it's it's good enough for what the competition is going to bring to you. How do you how do you work on that? I think for the for ADCC again for the Brazil ADCC, we started running a. I think it was for that, or maybe it was for the this most recent. ADCC trials that occurred. Um, we started running like a class with under you know ADCC rules. So um, you know we basically did like first point from a few different positions and, and areas that are unique to the ADCC rule set. Um, so we start standing and you got to try. You know you don't get points unless you take them down and and hold them on their back or or obviously get the back. Um, but we're doing that with submissions. So. You know, in wrestling class, I'll I'll just be doing takedowns without the submissions, um, but then we're putting that all together. You know, so I've got Craig Craig Jones or Kit or Levi. There's a bunch of good, really good grapplers we got there who are you know trying to guillotine me or submit me while I shoot my takedown in in that class. So I'm still getting that side of it as well. Um, I think it's very easy if you if you put submissions in with with takedowns when people first start doing wrestling they just won't shoot they shoot once they get caught in a guillotine they do it again they get caught again and then they're okay and they become very hesitant um and then they don't learn so i think it's much better to practice without the submissions first and get good at wrestling and then start adding the submissions in because it's it's some little adjustments will, will save you from getting um, the guillotine or the the Kimura or or anything like that. What was the other part of the question? I don't know, but that that is perfect. What I wanted to hear, like that is great advice about learning takedown, especially for us jujitsu people out there. You shoot once, yeah. you get guillotine. Okay, that I'll try to keep my my uh, my head up a little bit. Maybe my shoulders shrugged. Shoot again, guillotined again, and I'm okay. I'm done shooting because it didn't work and. And yeah, I, I don't have the right. confidence because you need confidence to take that shot. It's like uh, oh, yeah. going for an armbar from mount. You need confidence to do that because you you already have mount. You know, like you have to put a little bit of risk involved. But just the idea of just training without the guillotines or without the submissions at all, just to shoot, just to get that shot figured out, and then just make the little adjustments to the shot um, once you've got the actual shot figured out. That's that's a that's great training advice. Yeah, I think I'm, I'm trying to do that with um, like something to, to a similar effect with, with most of the techniques I'm teaching now as well because I realize often, you know, you show a technique and then or we at least do We do specific training, right, which is um, if, I, if I show, uh, let's say it's an armbar, but it could be a sweep or, or whatever. Uh, so here's an armbar. Now let's practice that with resistance. So you've got to try and do the move we just did against a resisting opponent. Um, but which is really good. It's better than just, I think it's much better than saying, let's just roll because then they've, they've seen the technique, but then they never actually felt what it's like to do it with resistance. And they'll, um, they may forget about it. Whereas at least you're getting them a chance to press it over and over and over again with resistance. And so they can f feel some of the, the ways people defend and hopefully, you know, uh, work their way around that 
yeah, that's my that's my goal when I do that. But um, I'm trying now to to even go a bit further than that because I think that's pretty hard. It's pretty hard to get a technique to work when you just learn it and someone's resisting. Does that make sense? Yeah, because they yeah. also just learned it and they, yeah, they've that, thought about yeah. it as well, and there's no surprise going on. That's right. Yeah. Um, so now I'm actually trying to do like with a like. I give the person who's defending like one or two options. Like you're you're only allowed to defend it by doing this particular thing. Like a common way that people defend, but uh, you know you're only allowed to defend by that. You can't do this, 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 and this all together because it's going to be very hard for them to navigate their way around that. And I think that's kind of similar to saying let's do red, you know, let's do takedowns, but you're not allowed to do the submission yet. Like it gives the person conf confidence to try it and they'll learn how to defend one part of the t- you know one part of the if you're doing wrestling and they're trying to do the submission um but there's, there's probably two parts here like if I, if I want to get someone down with a double leg for example there's the the sprawl and them just straight out defending my takedown and then there's them going for the submission if i can eliminate the submission part at least they've got they get to feel what it's like how to beat someone sprawling and how to beat them you know Trying to underhook you when you shoot, and uh, there's a bunch of different things you could put restraints on uh, to make it so it's a good process for learning for the person. Does that make sense? Yeah, it, you, you're, uh, you're doing a great job of explaining the concepts, and I think that um, you know, I think listeners would be really good to take this advice and and to kind of put limits on on themselves or limits on their uh, training partners and and switch back and forth. And, and really just kind of get that part of your game that needs work on it to be developed one step at a time instead of trying to take that big step and end up with the end result, um, first step, and then second step, and then we're going to add this. Uh, yeah. That's that's awesome. So, yeah, so, I mean, if I can break it down a bit more. Let's say there's, you know, you're teaching an armbar, and there's three ways the person can get out. There's, you, you've figured out there's three ways that they will escape the armbar, um, then you just tell the person defending, like, well, you can only do one, one of those three ways, okay? Um, and that way, the person who's new to the armbar still gets some, like, it's a challenge for them. You want it to be challenging because if it's too easy and the person's just reaching their arm up, then no one really learns much then. So they're still trying to get out in one certain way um, and you learn how to deal with that defense. And then you can say, okay, guys, now they're going to do the other way of defending the arbor, you know, the the defense number two, and then you learn how to beat that, and then you'd say, let's do defense number three, and then suddenly you actually know how to defend, you know how to beat, however they're defending the armbar, you now know how to beat it, you need to put it all together and do it as a full um, process, that's, that's ideal, I wish I could uh, do that more in training, and I should be doing that more, so, yeah. How does your training uh, change based on the event that's coming up next. And when do you make changes to that? Like ADCC has some pretty specific rules. If you're going to a gi tournament, you know, you got to get ready for that. Um, when do you make these adjustments and, and start making a strategy for a specific thing? Um, for ADCC, like as soon as we qualified, we, we were uh, actually even before the qualifiers because we want to win the qualifiers. Yeah. Uh, we, we were already training that rule set, you know, twice a week like in specifically in class and then at any nogi session obviously we'd focus on that um just generally i to, for my philosophy which uh, yeah, i think it's probably quite similar to marcelo garcia's for example is just have a game that that sort of transcends the different um the rule sets you know so if you if you got a game that's got if you got good grips that don't rely on the actual gi so a game that works gi or no gi in terms of the grips. You can obviously make, you know, if I'm tra- finding someone in the gi, I can still grip their gi, but it might be, you know, like underhooks, for example, are, are a great thing that work gi or no gi, you know? Yeah. Um, whereas if you're trying to play spider guard and then you go no gi, you're going to have a lot of trouble or, or lapel game. So I, I tend to avoid spider guard and, and lapel-based systems um, in favor of more like, you know, you know, grabbing a, getting a hold of a leg or you know, a, a wrist grip if I if I can, so that that helps a lot. And then 
specifically for an event, you know, I'll if it's an event I really care about, then I'll probably spend a good eight weeks beforehand, maybe even longer than that, um, probably focusing, you know, if, let's say it's the Mundia, the Gi Worlds, I would probably, you know, spend a good 10 weeks doing more Gi during that, the week than, than no Gi. But I'd still keep no Gi up. Um, I try and keep all my training up because I feel like you, you kind of lose it a bit if you, <laughs> if you don't train it. Um, yeah, does that answer it? Yeah. It, it really doesn't help you a ton if you've just worked five months on developing a great lapel guard or, like you said, spider guard. And now <laughs> that five months is, you know, it, it's awesome. You've got that like added to your game. And then a big no-gi tournament comes up and it's like, oh, what, what have I been doing to help this area of my game? Do you find that sometimes it's a little bit tougher to deal with somebody who does play like an active gi game or... Um, you know what I mean? Like, because I do the same uh, thing. My game is basically the same whether I'm wearing a gi or not. But I get sometimes I get tricked a little bit more easily than I think the average person with my skill level because I don't play with the lapel as much as I as I could, and I don't do that sort of thing. Um, I guess what well, one good thing for me, I, I have you know, I've gone through phases where I've played probably every you know, I used to. If you look at some of my footage from like you know four years ago, you'll you'll see me doing spider guard, and you know, like I've I've kind of gone through phases playing each type of guard and I actually think that's a really important process to do because you learn you learn even if you don't end up using that as your main game like you learn how how the leverage works from there and what's going to frustrate someone who who does play that game um but I actually don't think it matters I think it matters less what what they're doing and like you just need to be exposed to it a lot you know like if if everyone at your gym's doing you know, a lasso guard with a, you know, with the gi, and you're exposed to it all the time. But you, you never do lasso. You'll still get really good at dealing with it. It's, it gets hard when, like, if everyone at my gym had the same philosophy as me, and just did, like, a game that works gi and no gi, and then I went to a competition and someone starts playing spider guard, I'd, I'd be like, what's, what's going on? You know, I, I haven't. I haven't had to deal with these grips before. I don't know how to deal with these grips. Um, but if you've got a lot of people, or at least a, you know, even, even if you've just got one or two people at your academy that are quite good at, at that particular game, like I would I would just grab them every roll until you figure it out. Um, yeah, so I think as long as you're exposed to it, that's, the, that's more important than necessarily whether I play it myself. Yeah, that's a good point. I, I do think you get like a, a better understanding if you can play that game. But it, uh, sure. yeah. being exposed to it's a big deal. How do you develop that culture within the gym of getting people to have their own unique uh, game that they're playing? When you when you when someone asks a question about a technique in class or whatever, you say, "Oh, you should like, you, know, you should have a look at Michael Lange. If you want to learn Spider Guard, have a look at the way he's um, sweeping people." Or if you see someone's, you know, let's say someone's really flexible about the hips then you, you probably know they're going to be good with with a spider or a lasso guard especially if they've got long legs uh, and they're flexible so you can kind of direct people a little bit as well like i think you know if you studied this guy's game or watch this dvd he's got a great instructional series on a game that i think would really suit you um we well, we don't do this as much as again as, as i'd like but we we did have a video analysis class where we would sort of on the screen get everyone on a Saturday. This was um, on on Saturday mornings. We would get everyone after class. We'd sit down and study like a, a move that someone was doing in a competition, and we'd try and break it down. And you know, I would try and have a lot of variance in that, you know, especially if I found something interesting. And you know, the, the aim with that is hoping that um, then my students would go home and start looking up competitors and trying to study what they're what they're doing and, and try and emulate that so yeah I, I don't want them to be a, a clone of me i think it's better it's much better if, if you've got different games throughout the club yeah it'd be a healthier club with with a variety of games represented there yeah for sure so i'm, I'm curious about this uh you know, watching video with the students and, and trying to pick apart what's happening and, and learn from that. Is there, <laughs> how do you avoid the video that didn't actually help you as far as, yeah, maybe some high competitor did this, and but it's really kind of a 
kind of a weird situation or is not likely to actually be part of our game versus how do you find something that um, that several people might be able to bring into their game? Kind of the flashy move versus the the new but still very effective technique that you're looking at. Uh, is it you're asking how do I, like how do I choose yeah, that? Yeah, like or how do I, I guess know? basically. I get better word that question. Um, if someone's wanting to look for videos and 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 bring that into the part of their training, how do you make sure that it's not training that is uh, not going to help you in the long term? Yeah. Um, well, I mean, first, yeah, the the first thing I'd say is like, you know, what's the where's it being done? You know, like if it's being done at the World Championships, you you have to assume it's a, at least a an effective technique. Um, the problem is it could be it could be an effective technique in a very unlikely scenario. Like they just ended up, ended up in a very weird position, and they just you know, felt that they could you know do something odd here, and then a person went over. And it might be a mistake to think that's a deliberate you know setup to that technique, if that makes sense. Um, so if you look at things that are being done at the at a higher level, but also that are being done repeatedly, like how often is it occurring? Um, then you're already starting to find out, like if it's if it's happening a lot, if this person's always getting a sweep in a certain way, then you at least know it's an effective technique and then you probably just have to maybe have a look at their attributes as well and make sure, you know, like if the person's relying a lot on their flexibility for this sweep and you're not flexible, if you're 100 and, oh, we use, I don't, know, I don't use pounds, but you'd probably, let's say you're 200 pounds and you're you know, not flexible. Uh, you might not be able to do the same move that these, you know, that the, you see the Meow brothers doing, you know. <laughs> uh, but, yeah, so I think if it's common and if it's being done at a, if you see it a lot at, at high level, then that's that's the technique to work on. Yeah. If you, if you see something get done from a position that you can't even get to, probably not going to be real useful for you to work on that. But if it's a position yep. you're at all the time and it's something that you've never even seen before, it'd be worth looking into. Absolutely, yeah. Looking back, um, how much of your training early on uh, was, was you doing this, like looking at videos and trying to figure out what happened and, and that mm. sort of thing? Was it, quite, was it more then or, or is it always been about the same? I suppose I've always done it. Like... Um... You know, even before I was really studying jujitsu, I used to watch, you know, Kazushi Sakuraba and and try to <laughs> obviously it was MMA, but yeah. you know, try and copy his grappling techniques uh, when I was in jujitsu class. But um, uh, probably over the last, you know, from eight years ago when I really started, you know, taking jujitsu more seriously, it was, that was a lot. You know, I was looking at the Mendes brothers and the the Berambolo and all sorts of um techniques that I thought were pretty innovative um, compared to what we'd been learning. You know, Spider Guard was was one. and um, So I, I would say a lot. It's it's a funny thing where, like, actually I would, looking through my jiu-jitsu career, most of the guys that I see that have gotten really good have done something different to what their coach, like their game is actually quite different to what their coach um, has as their game. Why do you think, um, think that is? That's a very good question. Um, well, actually, I think for one, like most of the time, the best techniques, you know, like why not go? A lot of the time, you're going to say, well, why not just go to the source? Like, you know, for example, some of the people I'm thinking of were studying, you know, they were doing X guard and so on, which wasn't a popular thing at the time. You know, and they ex- really excelled and got really good. At grappling doing like basically Marcelo Garcia's game and I think that's just the fact that they're looking at well who's the best guy in the world right now and why don't I do what they're doing as opposed <laughs> which is kind of not what your coach <laughs> wants you to think uh, a lot of the time I actually want my students to think like that you know like if they if my students say to me oh, I'm not going to do your game Lachlan I'm going to do you know what Lucas Lepre's doing oh cool go for it like that's yeah. He's the he's the best guy in my weight division. Like he's, you know, uh, you sh- whatever he's doing, it's better than what I'm doing right now. At least, uh, yeah. <laughs> um, so I, I, I think like going to the 
to the best guys for a source of information is is um is definitely a good thing. But that said, I think like you know something I've definitely come to think now. Like if you if you watch the World Championships, you you might see the guy who's coming you know tenth, right? He could actually be the he could be the most technical guy in the in the competition, but he's just not the best competitor or doesn't doesn't have the speed or strength or power or whatever you know um, aggression mindset anything that, that's required to get him over the line. But you know, anyone that's competing at that level has very good technique, and I think we get we tend to want to just study the guys who are winning everything, you know, uh, but like, you know, the Mendes brothers and so on, but there's actually a, a bunch of people out there, I'm sure, have amazing technique that are just not being studied. Yeah, that's an interesting point, and it, it does, a lot of people do get overlooked. Could it be that if uh, somebody goes, let's just keep with Marcel Garcia, and they want to learn, uh, you know, the X guard, and they go there and they train, and, and they're really picking it up, and they're learning the details behind it, but also presented to them, is the opportunity to be in his X guard, and if if he can't sweep you with his X guard, or if you could pass his X guard, uh, you have one of the best games um, to 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 deal with that guard around. And I think that sometimes it's it is a good idea to look at your coach and try to do what they do, but it's also a great tool to to try to counter what they're doing because they're already really good at it, and it does make a different game. But uh, it's just like the opposite of what they're doing as far as, um, like you said, when you're, you're happy when your teammate goes and trains like somebody else because they have that to bring to you and it helps everybody. Yeah. Yeah, I think, um, you know, if we, if we go back to that, well, let's say my student, I have a student that, you know, the aim is for your students to get better than the coach, right? It's, it's going to be a long process for someone to get better than me at my own game that I've been doing for a long time right so if they're copying me I'm going to know everything they're doing and I'm going to make it really difficult but if I have a student that's you know studying a game that I'm not that familiar with he can he will then have an avenue to potentially make a pretty big leap in in catching up to me in, in making the role hard or potentially even beating me if they if they get proficient enough at that particular technique so i think i think a lot of that comes there like with people try a different thing that's that's like a different um technique or move that, that most people aren't doing and they actually get more success because no one's dealt with defending it and then at, then they're sort of ahead of the curve and as people are learning to defend they're learning how to counter that but it's it's kind of nice being the the person winning, I think you can adapt much better than if everyone's just crushing, stopping your game and crushing it right from the start. <laughs> yeah, it is. <laughs> it's nice to be a person that's winning and doing well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. you, you mentioned an interesting point that, that I don't know if I've heard on this show in, in well over 200 episodes, that somebody might in the top 10 uh, at a tournament you know, be you know, number 9, number 8, number 10, whatever. They might technically be the best person there. But for some reason, uh, physically or uh, mentally, they don't get out there and, and take first. And so they're often ignored. Um, it yeah. kind of just brings up the, the off-the-mat training, uh, body or mind. What do you do uh, off the mat to prepare yourself for a competition? And it could be mentally or it could be you know training off the mat. Um, off the mat? I don't do... I don't, I don't know. <laughs> I don't do too much. Uh, you mean like, bef- like the day before the competition? Yeah, no, or just like, are you? Double? Do you do weight training, or is all your physical training done on the mats? Are you um, doing any additional cardio? Oh, okay, um, I actually don't do any. Well, I, I, before ADCC, because I wanted to get a little bit heavier. I, I usually walk around at you know about seventy eight kilos if I'm if I'm fit and healthy, and ADCC is seventy seven kilograms, but you kind of want to – I want it to be actually about 81, 82 kilograms and then have to cut a bit to make weight for ADCC. So I actually started doing some weights. Um, I think I got up to about 81 kilos. So I did some weights for that. I, I definitely felt, to be honest, that I was a bit stronger and, and the benefits of it, but I just don't enjoy it. So I, <laughs> I actually don't do any weight training, um, which is uh, 
yeah, probably you know in the lead up to big competitions, I'll, I'll maybe be focusing on that a little bit more. Just I, I think certain areas, if you're strong, will make a big difference. But at the same time, you know, if you become more technical, that lasts forever. If you get stronger, it lasts until you stop doing weights. So it's a kind of a I, feel, I see it as almost like a short term boost in your abilities by doing weights. Um, unless you want to keep the weights going all the time, whereas you get like long-term improvements in your technique if you focus on that. So I, if I have to choose to be sore from weights or sore from jiu-jitsu, I'd rather be sore from jiu-jitsu. Yeah, and I think you kind of alluded to it's just not as an enjoyable a process for you. And yeah. jiu-jitsu is fun. Um, yeah. <laughs> and so that's I'm in exactly. the same boat. If If I could enjoy lifting weights, I would, I'd be in a lot better shape as far as uh, muscles go, but I enjoy jujitsu, so I have a kind of jujitsu guy's body, I guess. Yeah, it's it's interesting here, you know. Like, um, obviously, a lot of competitors do and don't lift weights, um, and and you see some people that are the best in the world that don't lift weights, which is amazing, um, and some people that lift weights like crazy. Even guys like I think this may or may not be true, so I don't know, but I've, I've, I believe. Rafael Mendes doesn't do weights anymore. I think he used to, but now he says he just wants to, you know, he thinks the technique's enough, which is which is pretty cool. Yeah, and and for the the competitors out there who are just trying to, to do their best, sometimes a, a little bit of off-the-mat training, whether it be cardio or weights, actually does make that difference. Because sometimes at the end of the competition, you get down to the last two people, the difference is so slight as far as who's going to win. And oh, it'd be absolutely. nice to be able to just outskill everybody, but if you could push the pace and make somebody tired or just physically have an advantage of somebody, it could be in the difference between getting gold or silver. Yeah, I think like I think cardio you can train by just rolling. Hard. Yeah, uh, that's actually one area where it's hard can be hard as a coach because you're you know you, you almost want someone else telling you to roll. <laughs> like it can easy to be it could be easy to get lazy. You know, you, you're tired. You're you're the one that's running the class. Like, oh, you know, we won't do any more rolls. <laughs> uh, <that's, laughs> you know, whereas if you got someone who's running the class and make, you know, come on guys, two more rounds. You know, let's go hard. That that's a uh, that's a good way to force people to to kind of push beyond their what they're comfortable with. Yeah, and and for me, it's. Uh, not usually lack of rounds, but it's it's who's next and then who's after that person and who's yeah. You know, after right. I get a few three or four good rounds in, I'm looking for the kid. I'm like, okay, let me see. And then somebody else grabs me. Oh man, here we go. <laughs> I don't need to take a full break, but you know, sometimes just taking a, a little bit lighter of a round is is kind of a way I think I cheat myself as far as getting the best cardio yeah, I can. Yeah. Then there's some gyms where they you know. They pick your training partners for you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. If you don't, yeah, which is and there's the people who naturally want the toughest match they can get every time. Yeah. And, and at the end of yeah. the the mat session, they're not doing well, but they've learned a lot and they've really pushed themselves. Yeah, that's anyway. They, yeah, that's good. <laughs> uh, Lachlan, I've had a lot of fun talking with you, getting to know you a little bit here. Um, are you up for playing a round of the Family Feud? All right, I got no idea what to expect. Yeah, here, so. <laughs> <laughs> that's, I guess that's the, the fun part. And they'll be quick there. Just to give you a heads up, they're not jujitsu related. I literally have like oh, really? the game Family Feud here, and I got questions out of that because I don't know how I would develop Family Feud questions for jujitsu. But here we go. Name something you do to make a good impression when interviewing for a job. Smile. Name something you do when you want to buy something you can't afford work <laughs> these, these, you know you're giving real good answers but uh i think they're they're uh they're they're actually good advice and i think people make mistakes in life <laughs> so okay <Yeah. laughs> name something you failed miserably at the first time you tried no nothing's coming to my head okay like the, there is plenty of things i just can't i don't know why nothing's coming to my head i'll try it we'll go to the next Sorry. one name something <laughs> You feel in the dark for. In the dark for, like yeah. I don't know much about. Like no, like you're feeling for something in the in this dark. Uh, like it's it's bad. No, okay. Uh, 
like in the middle of the night, you're feeling around for something, what would you be feeling for? Oh, okay. <laughs> I thought you meant like had like dark feelings oh. about something. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, probably your phone. Yeah. Phone. Okay. Name something you hate to get into when it's cold. Snow. <laughs> Snow. Okay. Well, Lachlan, um, you, you you did you got I think you were too. Um, you actually had good advice. Smile. Name something to do in a job interview. Smile. Uh, that's a you got eleven points for that answer. Dress nicely was the number one answer. I think a smile will go very far for you though. Uh, name something you can't do that you do when you can't afford to buy something. Um, work extra uh, was worth four points, <laughs> which is what you should do. Um, yeah, right. uh, charge it is the uh, or just go ahead and buy it anyway was the number one answer. Um, oh really? Yeah, but uh, I, I like your working attitude there. Um, name something that you failed miserably at the first time you tried. Uh, driving was the was the biggest answer there. Uh, name oh, something yeah, you feel actually, yeah, for that's, in the that's... dark. Uh, light switch was what was the number one answer, uh, followed by glasses. And then uh, really? name something wow. you. How did glasses help if you? I don't. know. <laughs> A phone, actually, uh, so a, a phone is the same thing as a flashlight. That's worth five points. Um, name something you hate to get into when it's cold. The number one answer was uh, a car. So oh, yeah. yeah, I hate that too. Yeah, more than the well, I'd hate to get in the snow more, <laughs> but I don't know what, what getting in the snow means. So. <laughs> <laughs> so you got you got twenty points. I think you had good answers, but they were just a little bit. Uh, you know, like it, it all says it with the you charge it to make it, uh, <laughs> you know, instead of work harder. Yeah. Um, I do know you have a, a lot of uh, people helping you out there. Do you have any sponsors you'd like to mention? Yeah, MA1 Apparel. So ma1.com.au or I believe they're in the States as well, ma1fitness.com. And what kind so of like strength, what kind of stuff do you have? Strength and conditioning you... gear. Okay. And, uh, in Australia, they've got geese. I'm not sure if they have that. I think they've got geese and so on in the states too but um yeah so it's they're very good they help us out a lot so yeah I, I do see that they have they have geese and and uh belts and and uh grappling shorts as well and they i'll put links to both the australian uh, website and the united states website on there for everybody to check them out perfect thank you very much Byron. thank you and where can we find you if if uh someone's want to come train with you or just your website uh, absolute Mixed Martial Arts St. Kilda, absolutemma.net.au. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you. Cheers. I'd like to thank Lachlan Giles for coming on the show here. Um, you know, one of the things I really liked is the thing that Byron uh, was so excited about. Right after Byron interviewed him, I was talking to Byron. He, you know, just smiled all over his face. And he was talking about the, the takedown part uh, that Lachlan was talking about, where a lot of times, you know, you practice takedowns, you end up, uh, you know, exposing your neck and you end up getting choked out and then you get gun shot. You just stop doing them. And what I like is what he's doing is he basically takes a, takes away submissions when you're going for your takedowns. Uh, basically, the takedown is uh, the most important part. You're trying to get it to the floor. And if you just keep getting choked out every time, you're going to stop it. You're, you're going to stop going for it. So I just kind of like, you know, I thought that was a great idea. You know, let's get the takedown down. Let's get the level change, you know, get the shot in there. You know, let's, let's push through, uh, you know, let's take the person down. And then once we get that part down, then we'll start working on, you know, little alterations, you know, to make sure our head, you know, is not exposed. Uh, you know, maybe work on a, keep your head in the chest, uh, you know, how to hop the legs to get into side side mount. But uh, I just thought that was great advice and, uh, you know, something I could have really used early in my career where, you know, I was going for takedowns. I was getting choked out. So then I would be like, OK, cool. You take me down. I want to choke somebody out instead. And uh, that's probably why my uh, stand-up game uh, is garbage, uh, just uh, due to that. Yep, got to have a top and a bottom game. So really great interview, uh, really knowledgeable guy. Yeah, look forward. Um, you know, we don't ever want to have somebody, you know, back on super fast. But, yeah, we'll be getting him back on the show uh, as, as time marches on. And just look forward to having him become one of our people we get on every year or so and we learn from and catch back up with. So, yeah, hopefully he's up for that again, I hope. <laughs> 
and uh, yeah, continue to get uh, guests like him and also him back on the show. That, that was, I know you guys enjoyed the interview. Uh, I had such a great time doing it. I, I feel like when that's a good marker for me, if I'm having a good time, I'm learning a lot. I know that the audience probably is too as well. Yeah, I noticed like on all the, you know, I haven't been in very many interviews. You do them most, but it's like you said, you end up, uh, and I know Joe, you've done some too. You end up, you know, just having a good time with the interview and every interview I've been in, I've had a really great time except for one. Can you guess which one that might be? <laughs> the, so, the... So, somebody interviewed Byron at one point, didn't they? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Maybe that's it. Man, that, that was that a tough it. episode. Joe for a thousand. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, it, it's tough when you get a boring guest or a boring uh, interview. <laughs> yeah, it, it's terrible. No, well, but really, uh, what's not to like about sitting around and talking jujitsu with somebody that's really good at it, has a lot of knowledge to share, an hour just doesn't seem like enough time most of the Yeah, and it's crazy like what you and Byron were saying that y- we learn – from audio, you know, we think that we have to see a, a video to learn and, you know, a demonstration. But, you know, we started this show talking about ways to communicate. And, you know, when you have an instructor, you know, like Lachlan there who can explain stuff so well, you know, just, you know, with words without even, uh, you know, demonstrating it, you know, you know, you've got an incredible instructor and and, you know, somebody who can make you understand it just with the words part. And, you know, like Joe said, I could talk to Jitsu all day long. It's, uh, you know, it's a time that, uh, it's my happy spot, my happy time. That, you know what, I'm going to do a little bit of history here. Uh, <laughs> really, I don't remember how much you just remember, Gary, we have Friday night trainings, uh, a small group. I think three yeah. was a perfect number. Always odd. So you kind of wrote, we do a lot of round robin positional sparring. And this was, while I had the website, but I did not have the podcast. And we would get done, say bye to everybody, and then we would just chat about jujitsu in the parking lot forever. You know, like you and me, we'd just kind of go back and forth and talk about this or that. And then somewhere it clicked like, we should do a podcast because that's if we just record these conversations, I think it would be interesting. And we've both learned a lot since then and, and, and sharpened our ideas. But uh, that's kind of what got the idea in my head anyway about doing a podcast. You know, the good thing about us doing jujitsu when we went and we'd spend, you know, 20 minutes, 30 minutes after in the parking lot talking about it, that parking lot was in a bad area of town. And, <laughs> yes, uh, it was. That jujitsu could have saved us. You know, I'm looking back at it now and I was like, man, we used to just sit there in the parking lot. I'm surprised we didn't get jacked. Yeah, we were too sweaty to get messed with. Yeah, and uh, too ugly. Yes, that also helps. Yeah. That's another benefit. Yeah. Uh, of being ugly, I guess. <laughs> oh, man. Joe, do, Joe doesn't have that problem. Yeah, right. I'm uh, old, broken, beaten, scarred. <laughs> <laughs> I guess no one messes with that guy anyway. So, yeah, you know, it, that's the guy you don't want to mess with. It's uh, yeah, that guy. He, he, last person I want to mess with. Something that you might want to mess with is our. Uh, w- Something you might want to mess with is our sponsor. Uh, it's Health IQ. And if you're interested in getting a uh, really good rate on life insurance, uh, c- click on the little banner on the website or in, in your show notes and uh, check it out. And get, you can get a free quote on your life insurance. You're a healthy person. You're training all the time or at least several times a week, I hope. And uh, really, it's going to show with – the, the benefits on and off the mat. You're, a, you're getting better. Just, that's awesome. B, off the mat, you're living a healthier lifestyle, even if it's just because you work out. Typically, when you start working out doing jiu-jitsu, you eat a little healthier because you notice that when you're on the mat and you eat garbage before, you don't perform as well. And so it just kind of helps you clean up your, your diet a little bit, and, and maybe you'll sleep a little bit better at night. So all these things kind of compound, and you end up living longer. Health IQ recognizes that. Uh, they contacted us and said, "Hey, you know, we're really looking at in, into sponsoring a jiu-jitsu style of podcast because, you know, jiu-jitsu is a healthy lifestyle. You guys are going to live longer than the average people out there." And I'm like, "Yeah, we are. It's no secret to us. We're if you do this correctly, you add years to your life. If you do it incorrectly, you end up all broken, beat up, 
<laughs> and uh, kind of like what move. Joe just said he was. <laughs> that's I mean that's part of the podcast is we're trying to communicate how to train properly to where you can keep doing this for a long, long time. You don't. I think we all had similar starts where we're trying to be tougher than we need to be. We're we're hard on our bodies. We're training with people who aren't really uh, being super safe with us sometimes, and uh, not super safe. I mean, but just you know you'd be considerate. Uh, you know, I, I fully expect most of my training partners to actually get close to injuring me if I don't tap in time. But I tap in time, so it's not a, you know that's that's how we train. But uh, it, anyway, the, the, the jujitsu lifestyle is a healthy one. If you're listening to the podcast, you probably are living a fairly high, healthy lifestyle, probably more healthy than the average uh, cat out there. And uh, check the website out; you can learn more about it. You get a free quote and see if you qualify, my friends. You know, one of the best things is. How many people have you seen start jujitsu that, you know, are overweight and maybe on, you know, uh, statins, uh, you know, maybe have high blood pressure and, you know, a year into their journey, they have lost so much weight. They're off medicine. Um, they're really watching what they're eating and, and just became so much more healthier. And, uh, you know, jujitsu is, you know, changes a lot of people's lives. And, uh, you know, especially you put all that time into being healthy. Why pay higher rates, you know, and being grouped in with people who are unhealthy? And and that's the cool thing about Health IQ. So definitely check it out. Uh, go online and get a quote or call them up and uh, definitely let them know that uh, you heard about it from BJJ Brick. Yep. Tell a friend. And, hey, uh, if you like this podcast, tell a friend about this podcast as well. Uh, we've got almost 4,000 likes on Facebook. Our uh, downloads are growing, so we appreciate you guys passing the word on. If you see something you like, share it with your friends. Yeah, that we, we are not a major uh, player in uh, the podcasting world or the jiu-jitsu world, but we are doing – we're one of the top jiu-jitsu podcasts. It's because people like you share the word. We're not you know, buying tons of ads. Um, we might in the future, you know, as as we're growing and, and trying, to, trying to build the show, but we really want to just have a good time and keep qu- producing quality content. And uh, <laughs> that's been done uh, with you guys sharing the podcast, you guys supporting us on Patreon, and, uh, you know, getting a, a little bit of sponsorship here and there to help do a little of the show. But uh, largely, the audience, you guys, are uh, our biggest support that we could have. And Byron, who's the MVP this week? Who is our newest member? Oh, man. Okay, you're talking about Patreon. Brian B. from Texas. Uh, thanks so much for signing up on Patreon. He's going to support the show. Uh, every time a show comes out, Brian's kicking us a buck. And uh, just to say, hey, I appreciate it. It's helping me out in my jiu-jitsu. It's worth a dollar a week um, to, uh, to support you guys. And, man, so Brian... Thanks so much, my friend. I would like to get you added to the Facebook private group uh, so you can have input on you know stuff we ask, future guests, and that sort of thing. I found you on Facebook, my friend, but I can't add you as a as a friend or a member, so I need you to contact me and uh, and, and add me as a friend, and then I'll get you into the group if, if that's something you want to do. If not, it's, uh, that's fine. Not everybody's a member of the group that uh, supports us on Patreon. I also sent him a, a five-inch BJJ Brick Gee Patch, and a sticker. So, uh, yeah, hopefully uh, we'll be seeing Brian soon. He's in Texas, kind of near the Dallas area. And hopefully he'll be coming up for the uh, big BJJ Brick event, June 23rd, 24th. We said last time that uh, you kind of have to cap it at these people that were already signed up. But that episode didn't air until Brian already signed up. So, Brian, you were the last one who's eligible for attending this event and having it uh, having us cover you. So, Congrats on that, Brian. Hope to see you up here. We'll cover your door charges. Uh, you got to get here, my friend, and we'll have a great time. Ding, 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 ding. We have a winner. That's <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Brian from Texas, if you're ever down in Houston, uh, let us know. I'm in Lake Jackson, and I'd love to train with you. I- any other listeners, if you're ever traveling through the Houston area or New Orleans, I spent some time in Louisiana, let me know. I'd love to come train with you. And uh, Gary, where can they uh, train with you? Wichita, Kansas. Uh, if you're ever in the Midwest, the air capital of the world, stop on by or give us a send us a message on our Facebook page, bjjbrick at gmail.com. We'd love to train with you. Um, hey, also about 
Brian there. Uh, he is actually uh, thinking about making a mat tail for us, too. Um, so I told him uh, if he does, to uh, send it in to us at bjjbrick at gmail.com. We haven't had a mat tail in a long time, um, so I'm going to plug mat tail. So if you have some crazy thing that has happened in your jujitsu journey, anything that uh, you want to uh, put into a story format, into a, just send us an email. Uh, Byron will jazz it all up and make it sound cool. But uh, definitely uh, send it to us at bjjbrick at gmail.com. I, uh, just for fun, it's been, it has been a while. I've been so busy, I haven't been able to make Matt Tales. Uh, but we do need the stories coming in because they kind of build each other. So Brian's will be sent in, hopefully, and hopefully a few more get sent after that, and it'll build. I'm going to air an old Matt Tale just to kind of give you guys a – a little sample of what's happening here. So here we go. Here's an old Matt tale. This is Matt Tales. We bring you amazing jujitsu stories. The stories might be funny, unfortunate. It could be about an epic fail or an epic win. So sit back, my friend. Relax. Dry off your sweat from rolling and enjoy Matt Tales. I own and operate a small jujitsu gym. We're a growing group of people who like to have fun on the mats and work very hard. As the years go by and the clock ticks, we have definitely developed an adult sense of humor with the language to back it up. With many of our adults wanting to bring kids in and start a kids class, I decided that we needed to clean up our language. And what better way than to clean up our language and make a little bit of money at the same time was to start a swear jar, where if you're heard saying a cuss word, which are quite frequent in my gym, you put in a dollar to cover that word. Well, shoot, as I said that day, this is going to be a challenge. All us knuckleheads and cusserinos are going to have a tough time not paying this jar a bunch of money. Well, it started to backfire pretty much immediately. When several of the students put in money in advance and enjoyed the idea kind of mockingly. By the end of the second day, the swear jar had $120 and the cuss words were flowing like a f***ing river. It's the third day. The third day started to get to me. My students saw that I was not cussing, and they wanted to change that. They started to get a little bit ornery. That day, I couldn't find my f***ing shoes. Little did I know they hid them from me, and I ended up paying $3 to the swear jar before I found them. The next day, one of them, quote, accidentally wore my gi as he warmed up and got it all sweaty. I don't want to wear my sweaty gi when some other shit head had it on, getting it all sweaty. I believe that one cost me about five bucks. About a week or so after the swear jar started, and I'm training and teaching class and everything's going great, no one's saying any cuss words or anything like that, class is over. Not a dollar has been paid to the swear jar. I'm really feeling proud. I feel like we're ready to start a kids class. We could bring kids into this environment and have them not exposed to that kind of a language. I go to my car and it's missing. My car was missing. Shortly before I called the police, my students informed me that they just relocated it around the block. $20 in the swear jar. Although this swear jar has cost us some money, we're going to be buying a few different kids' keys for kids to use while they try out our gym. So that's definitely a win. And it also helped us not swear so f***ing much. This has been Matt Tales. Some of the names and places may have changed. We may, in fact, have taken some creative liberties with the story. In order to keep Matt Tales going, we need more tales. Tales from listeners like you. Send your tales to bjjbrick at gmail.com. 
We look forward to hearing your amazing stories. All right, that was that's fun to relive those. <laughs> it's crazy. I work so hard on each Matt tale, and we air it one time, and it's like, okay, there's five minutes, and then it goes away forever. So I don't feel uh, bad about re-airing those. I know you guys enjoy listening to those stories. I mentioned the BJJ Brick event. June 23rd, Tim Sled, Roy Delgado will be in Wichita, Kansas, training with us and teaching seminars. June 24th, we'll be teaching a little bit of jiu-jitsu that, that we like to do, the BJJ Brick crew, and rolling with you guys. Uh, and, of course, we'll be hanging out off the mat, on the mat, uh, a lot of good times. Uh, we're looking forward to getting people from in Wichita to train and also people from out of town. If you're coming from uh, a ways out town, out of town, send me an email. Make sure that I know you're coming, and we'll set up a, a little bit of a reward system. We're going to be giving away some DVDs. Uh, I review DVDs on the YouTube channel, and uh, I've got them piling up, and, man, not doing me any good anymore. Uh, so time to pass on and share the wealth. So that could be you if you're coming from – I don't know what I think. If you're coming from more than fifty or hundred miles away, uh, let me know in advance, and I'll put you down. First come, first serve on the DVD pile, my friends. Register quick, or at least let me know quick. <laughs> We'd love to make it uh, as much fun and worthwhile as possible. And that's one thing I think we could do to to uh, reward you guys for showing up and having a good time with us. Make sure and bring your best gi for the glamour photo shoot with uh, Gary and Byron. <laughs> I don't look good for that, guys. Man, yeah, I like then, style. Uh, maybe we can all get matching tattoos like we talked about earlier, too. So that'd be something well, kind of yeah, cool. Yeah, BJJ Brick Event 2018, uh, June. Yeah. <laughs> like, who wouldn't want that on their body forever? Yeah, yeah, that's... Uh, yeah, that's awesome. That's awesome. That's a mistake. <laughs> <laughs> What's not a mistake is BernardoFria.com. Man, I just... man. I really appreciate Bernardo, world-class athlete, uh, multiple-time black belt world champion. Look at his website. He's putting out stuff all the time, helping people get better at jiu-jitsu. He's kind of making the transition from, you know, athlete to coach and, and entrepreneur online and helping people get better at jiu-jitsu for what he can. And his art, he had an article. He does articles all the time. It's great stuff. Uh, purple, his article is called Purple Belt. The Hardest Belt in BJJ. We'll put a link in the show notes. Check it out, man. It's cool. Um, so he's just kind of sharing some of his thoughts about the different belt levels, uh, why some of them are tough, why some of them are not as tough. And he's calling Purple, purple Belt. Uh, I don't know why I stumbled over the word purple. Uh, it's kind of the middle of the journey where a lot of people struggle. Uh, white Belt, he says, it's good because you're just starting and you're happy and you're excited to train. And, you know, Blue Belt, you, you're happy about getting that first promotion. Purple Belt, he sees people kind of stall out sometimes and, and get frustrated with their progress because, man, Purple Belts are good at jiu-jitsu. If you just became, you know, you just got your Purple Belt, you're just basically on the border from Blue to Purple. Some of those Purple Belts are tapping out Brown Belts pretty regularly. Those guys are animals. And it's just like, I, I understand that can be a frustrating belt. It's oftentimes the longest belt as well. You spend a lot of time there. But, uh, yeah, so he's calling the purple belt the hardest belt in BJJ. You know, I really like Bernardo. I like the content he puts out. One of the things I like about him is he doesn't get uh, try and get lost in the weeds and deep and nerd out on, uh, you know, fine details and concepts he's just he keeps it pretty simple and everybody can relate to what he writes and he's just writing this from his own perception perspective and i i appreciate that um as the purple belt among this group um i'm not sure what i would say about it i think it might be the point in your career where you sort of realize that it's a really really long journey i mean you know that at white belt you know it at blue belt but um, there is something about just about working really, really hard at something for five or six years and uh, then kind of just being at the midway point, especially in a day and age where we see other martial arts that have gone the other direction. And, you know, five years in, if you're not a black belt, there's something wrong. So maybe from that perspective, it's a little bit difficult, but I, I don't know. I, so far, I haven't found it to be any more difficult being a purple belt than I did a blue belt. Yeah, I think they're all all tough. I mean, jiu-jitsu is not an easy sport. We're going to go through trials and tribulations, struggles, ups and downs. Uh, you know, uh, I, I just remember being as a, as a white belt. And when, you know, I had a white belt, I was thinking how 
you know, along that journey is kind of like what you're saying and, and how I was just getting beat up every day. I was learning stuff, but I just didn't put it together. Um, it's, uh, you know, I see where he's coming from a purple belt. Like uh, you were saying, it's right in the middle of, you know, the belts. You, you still got a long way to go. And you've learned so much at, at blue and, and white that you're just not learning new stuff all the time. I think, you know, you start getting into concepts a lot more. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's, uh, I don't know what I felt has been the toughest belt. Um, you know, I don't have a black belt, so I can't tell you on that, but, uh, it's, uh, you know, I, I just think they're all kind of tough and, uh, it's, uh, never, never an easy time. Yeah. Uh, it, everybody's journey is different. So if you're a blue belt and you're experiencing a lot of difficult times, that might be your personal toughest belt. But he does see a lot of people struggle with purple, purple belt. So there I have to blow the word again. <laughs> uh, so, I, you know, it's just, it's unique to us. But a lot of people hit like a plateau at purple and they get frustrated. Uh, so just take that for what it's worth. I do think that off the mat things could could devastate your jiu-jitsu more than any you know, on the mat troubles you get if you have troubles with relationships family troubles health troubles uh, you know trouble keeping a job or, or having a hard time at school of course your jiu-jitsu is going to suffer and you know I'm, I'm thankful my life right now is pretty stable and i'm able to keep training but certainly if uh my wife or i become unhealthy or you know my job gets in jeopardy whatever Oh yeah, <laughs> Jiu Jitsu is gonna have to have to either take a back burner or it's gonna suffer a lot. Yeah, the podcast might be in a little bit of trouble. I, you know, like certain it's just the life cycle that we go through, and it's hard to say that because you're purple belt, if you're able to train a ton and it's the perfect time of your life to train, you should you should might go straight through it, and then you get to brown belt, and then you're going through a divorce or something. You know, is tough. And man, brown belt sucked for you. Well, that's you know we all have to deal with our own struggles. Um, I, I was thinking about this article, and I'm just I was rolling with the white belt the other day. Person had about six months on the mat, and I got to thinking all of the white belts with six months on the mat that I have rolled with in a long time are way better than I was when I had a year on the mat. It's just the the training is better. Uh, when you know, really Gary, we had a purple belt with us and then a group of white belts. So our training partners were other white belts, and now you get a and gym, we and we only had two days a week. Yeah. So I like, mean, if you missed one of those days, it, we didn't <laughs> have other week? days to go to. Yeah. Yeah. It's just, it's just, and I think that's the way it is for Jiu-Jitsu all over the place. White belts today, with six months, are better than white belts. Uh, you know, ten years ago, fifteen years ago, with way more time than six months, we're, we're I don't know. So if you experience that frustration, just know that you're you're probably doing the right things. It's just a tough thing. Uh, I know my wife is better than I was when I had the same amount of time on the mat as she did. It, hands easy comparison. I mean, she's just more technical. Uh, she she's doing things correctly that I know I was doing wrong at, at her time frame. I don't know. It, it's hard to compare, and it's not necessarily healthy to compare yourself with other people. But just know that there's never been a better time to train jiu-jitsu than right now. So check out the article. We'll put a link in the show notes, uh, BernardoFria.com. And there's lots of good stuff there. We could use this about every week, but uh, yeah. we like to we like to kind of spread it around a little bit more like jelly. Yeah. Hey, also definitely go on there. He's got a free ebook, uh, Your Guide to a Lifetime of Enjoying and Improving Your Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. So definitely a free ebook. Anything that's free, you can't beat that, and especially from Bernardo. So uh, just go on there, click on the free ebook link, and uh, you'll love it as much as I do. Man, now, I collect those things. I don't know about anybody else, <laughs> but there's there's a lot of guys out there that do a, a free ebook or free mini seminar online or something. I, I get all those things, and me, I learn a ton too. from them. So uh, take advantage of the resources available, guys. Yeah, just like what, what Byron was saying. You know, it's a great time, you know, compared to when we started, there there wasn't much out there. But all these free ebooks and free seminars, like, like Joe said, I, I'm a I'm a nerd and I, I, I grab all those, too. And any free resource I can get, I, I'm loving it. Joe is calling you a nerd because you guys got matching tattoos and his is actually temporary. And he tricked <laughs> you into getting the real ones. <laughs> I told you he's smarter than me. But, uh, you know. 
the the thing too, you know, we're talking about smart. We're talking about, you know, a penny saved is a penny earned, increasing our knowledge. And uh, that's what I really like. People trying to go forward, increasing their knowledge, trying to improve a deficiency. And today we're going to change it around a little bit here. Uh, Byron's got an ebook. And uh, Byron is just Byron. <laughs> No, just Byron. Just Byron. Um, you know, what had happened here one day is uh, Byron woke up, and it may have been due to being choked out numerous right. times, but all of a sudden he had issues, and uh, he could not say some words. He had a lisp. He couldn't say purple anymore. So what Byron does is he now is getting, you know, he has an e-book that he's going to talk about that's uh, not an e-book, but uh, uh, what do we call him? Uh, audio book? Audio book. Audio book, an A-book. He's got an A book coming out <laughs> where he's going to teach us, you know, how to stop the lisp and say purple properly, purple properly. And that's one of the, the we have to say that 10 times every morning, purple properly. And uh, so, Byron, tell us about uh, how you got this lisp, you know, and yeah. how you have struggles saying, you know, the P words, you know, like purple and properly. And okay. Persimmon. This is it, persimmon. <laughs> It's a bit of an embarrassing story. And, uh, you know, okay, this is the time in the podcast where uh, one of us throws a, another person a fake audiobook, and we got to explain it in case you're new to the show. That's what's happening here. Although this audiobook is very real, right, Gary? It is definitely real. Wouldn't you agree, Joe? I would agree. And I also have to say that that was a little bit deceptive, Byron, when you say, one of us always throws the other. <laughs> yeah. like, it, like sometimes yeah. it goes one way and sometimes it goes the other. What you really meant is every week when I throw Gary and Joe under the bus. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Okay. Well, so this is about dealing with a bit of a list. And what he mentioned about, you know, waking up and, and starting with that. Uh, Gary and Joe got matching tattoos. Joe tricked Gary into getting a real one. Uh, he's a bit upset by this. He chokes me unconscious. Uh, well, uh, training, he said, "Let's roll half speed." And man, he came at me like a wounded cougar, and and put me out. I didn't see it coming. I had your back, literally. You did. You took my back, literally, for the first time in a long time. I wake up, and it appears that I have a tongue ring now. I don't know how you pulled that sort of a thing off while I was unconscious for the few seconds, but man, I can't talk quite right, and being purple is difficult. Uh, I need to get the thing taken out of there. And that's basically what it boils down to. Um, it's not really how to deal with it. It's more about um, training, trusting your training partners to not do anything like that while you're choked unconscious. I'm grateful that he let go of the choke. Uh, not really grateful of the piercing I received <laughs> uh, while I was out. But it'll all go away once I remove this thing. So, yeah... Gary Byron's giving us this crazy story and it sounds like something your kid comes home with when he just got a new lip ring and he needs an excuse to tell you how he got it. How did he get it? (laughs) (laughs) It was a long night in Galveston, Texas. (laughs) Uh, But so, you know, you ended up with a tongue ring. Why didn't you just take the tongue ring out, Byron, so you could say the P words like purple, persimmons, properly. Uh, that's a that's a good question. Um, I was hoping it would somehow enhance my grappling ability. And I didn't think it. You were telling me to enhance something else, but not your grappling ability. That's so. Uh, that was a big misunderstanding. <laughs> <laughs> and if anything, it's making my grappling worse. Uh, so yeah, I'm gonna have to remove it. Uh, I still haven't even bothered to take my mouthpiece out yet from when I was rolling. So I'm just really. Really caught off guard by this whole thing and just surprised uh, by by getting this. The, the moral of the story is don't let Gary take her back, even figuratively. <laughs> but, you know, I like that you, after, you know, your very last chapter, you talk about tongue exercises so you can say different, you know, you can speak different tongues and you can, uh, you know, speak say tongues. different words. Yeah, you speak in tongue. So tell us about how you speak in tongue. That was pretty neat. Yeah, that's the uh, Gary. You're really throwing me under this bus here. That's moving pretty fast. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> uh, 
that, that's a top secret chapter. I'm still working on developing that right now. Um, basically, you want to do this while you're rolling and just confuse somebody. It could be anything from just kind of mumbling something that they can't understand. They try to comprehend what you just said, and then you, boom, you slap on uh, your submission to uh, mumble something that they think they understand that doesn't even make sense. And kind of like that double speak that they did on Saturday Night, Saturday Night Live and just confusing your opponent. That's that's basically been the biggest advantage of this whole thing. That's that's great advice. Yeah, not really, Gary, but that's all I can come up with. <laughs> I had an audiobook for you, but maybe we'll save it for next week. Something about the grappling chaps and attacking, uh, turning turtle guard and the horse guard. But, uh, <laughs> well, I, you know, I mean, that's the thing about, uh, jujitsu. I mean, we have to be able to move on the fly, that's be able right. to change stuff up. And, and I know Joe and I were going to go down a road we didn't really want to go down. So, uh, I had to, uh, change it around here pretty quick. And another and, uh, important it- concept in jujitsu is going first. Go first. You know, if you should take down, if you want to start past, like, just go before the other person starts to go. And Gary did that. Well played, my friend. Thank you. Joe, we got a day that we can just rest a little bit. <laughs> nice. Thank you. You had my back today. <laughs> Figuratively. <laughs> oh, next week, man, we got a, a really nice show. Uh, Stephen Whittier is back on the show. I, I was looking. It's been years since he's been on the show and had a great interview with him the first time around. Super happy to get him back on. I can't believe it's been this long. And uh, just just happy to share what he's doing. He's helping um, everybody, but really geared towards a little bit older grapplers, which I know a couple, and uh, helping to stay on the mat and get all the benefits that Jiu-Jitsu can provide. Joe, I think uh, Byron was taking a couple more pot shots at us. I think he was, but uh, there's some truth in the statement. And if you're out there and you've got a a gimpy shoulder, gimpy knee, you're just not as young as you used to be. Uh, this is one guy you want to pay attention to. He's, he's got some good resources out there for us older guys. Yep, even if you got a gimpy tongue. <laughs> yep. <laughs> no, it doesn't really help you on that category. Anyway, I had a great time this week, guys. Uh, even if I got a little bit uh, out of uh, my hands, <laughs> into my mouth. Uh, that's not first. <laughs> <laughs> Man, this this show has really went off topic. <laughs> we'll catch you guys next week. Stay sweaty, my friends. And don't forget to shower. Train hard, train smart, get better, and uh, we'll see you on the mats, guys. Hang in there, Purple Belts. Thank you for listening. I hope you find the time today to roll. After all, the best way to get better at Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu is to do Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. So how much of that of your training, uh, and this might get kind of back into the history of jiu-jitsu in Australia, um, was done with, with videos and, and sort of that sort of <clears throat> that's a poor sentence. How much of that training was used, how much of your training early on was videos or people coming in, teaching a seminar, and you had to grab onto that when you had it versus having just great training partners around you all the time? You're talking about uh, it, it, like – 15 that, years ago? Or, yeah, or, that was a, uh, let me, I'll just retry the whole damn question because that was terrible. Uh, that's all right. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, okay. Um, looking back, um, how much of your training early on uh, was, was you doing this, like looking at videos and trying to figure out what happened? Thanks so much for checking out this episode. Hope you enjoyed it. Hope you learned something. Check us out next week. And don't forget to check out the archives at bjbrick.com or on this YouTube channel.